We live in a space age. But that brings its own special problems. With rockets in orbit, and moon probes, not to mention the more humble but still fantastically efficient planes, the world seems to be shrinking. We're closer to our neighbor nations than ever before in human history. But the closer we are to other peoples, the greater are the human problems to be solved. Take language. We can bounce a signal off a spaceship, but we can't talk to our neighbors in the Pacific Islands. Then economic standards. We can cross the skies by plane to Indonesia in a few hours. But that only makes it so much easier for us to see that half the world's population is underfed. Look at the problem of racial barriers. Fast ships can take us across the oceans, but they can't cross the barrier between black and white, between African and Afrikaans. We're living closer together. But you know, that our greatest problem in the space age is how to live at peace with each other. I found the Christian answer to this problem at a conference I attended at Hutt City. Lower Hutt was going to play host to the third ecumenical youth conference, by far the biggest interchurch youth gathering ever held in this country. 1,600 members came from many places. They came from all parts of New Zealand. It was a young people's affair. The age limit was between 17 and 30, but exceptions were made for speakers and leaders. Among the first to arrive was a party of Australians who'd crossed the Tasman to be with us. From Hong Kong came Miss Sung, a Christian worker and herself a refugee from communist China. The Reverend Alan Booth from the World Council of Churches in London. The Reverend Philip Potter, a Jamaican who's been Youth Secretary of the World Council of Churches in Geneva. Groups from the Pacific Islands, from the Solomons and the Cook Islands. We belonged to many different churches and we had to learn to talk about our differences and about the things we share. We had to learn to worship together, to live together. The one thing that held us together, that converted that heterogeneous crowd into a tolerant, helpful family, was our faith in Jesus Christ and our loyalty to him. We were housed in local schools, 10 of them. We were made so comfortable that it was very easy for some of us to sleep in. We even had a special bus service laid on to take us to the Civic Center, which was the focal point for conference activities. Meals were in the horticultural hall next to the town hall. The caterer and his staff of 50 served over 42,000 meals during the nine days of the conference. Perhaps the title conference could give a wrong idea. Perhaps it suggests solemn people around a boardroom in heavy discussion. We weren't that. Certainly the conference had its serious moments, and we tried to get our teeth into the problems that are facing our day and generation. You could see that especially in the study groups. There were a hundred groups like ours. Sixteen or seventeen of us in each group grappled with the big issues of race, of space, of the disunity of the church, things that matter. Yes, we could be serious. We talked hard. And listened, too. We prayed hard. We learned a new way of singing the Lord's Prayer to Jamaican Calypso. Does that sound strange? 
The way Mrs. Potter, wife of the Reverend Philip Potter, taught it to us, it became intensely devotional. But we also played hard. Being a Christian doesn't mean that life's too serious for fun. There's always plenty of opportunity to let off steam. The Jamaican tradition at the wicket was kept up by one of our chief speakers. We danced. Scottish country dancing was a popular item. It was led by Eric Scott, one of the young teachers brought out by the government from Scotland to relieve the staff shortage in our schools. Another kind of dancing came to us from the West Indies. Mrs. Potter taught a group to perform these dances. The rhythms are strange, but we soon became familiar with them. There were opportunities to follow up special lines of interest, to equip us better for leadership among church youth groups back home. One class learned how to use film projectors and other modern teaching aids. Another group studied new Sunday school teaching techniques. Many found a new interest in the production of religious drama, one of the oldest and one of the newest methods of presenting the Christian story. We had a choir, 600 of us. We were led by a Christchurch conductor, Francis Dennis. Anglicans learned Methodist hymns, Baptists discovered Presbyterian psalms. The choir led the singing for the evening meetings in the open air. The public was invited to come. These meetings raised the big issues of our day and emphasized our Christian responsibility concerning them. Eminent speakers from New Zealand and overseas gave us a lot to think about. The Reverend Alan Booth is a specialist in international affairs and he challenged us to think out what the Christian gospel means in this modern age. How can the races of men learn to belong together? Can we in this land be content to live in our plenty while others starve? How can we meet the spiritual needs of new nations as they reach out for new ideas? Another of the conference speakers was the Bishop of Auckland who made us feel the tragedy that the churches themselves are not united. We had to think hard about these things. The Reverend Philip Potter was a helpful guide and a true leader when he took us for Bible study each morning. The Bible has the answer to our problems today, as it's always had the answer to men's problems in the past. It points out that the affairs of men are also the concern of God. We are not merely the playthings of economic forces, we are the children of God. So that's where we came to in our conference. We felt that we were one family, living, eating, studying, worshipping together, and that it was the grace of God that made us one. Do you feel perhaps that this might be the clue 
to the problem of living in the space age. That in exactly the same way, God is drawing the nations of the earth together by the miracles of modern technology so that we can learn to be one family. So that we can see his purpose for our life and learn by faith to break down the barriers that divide us. And finally, to be at one with him and with one another.